from Two Keto LLC. It's Keto Woman Podcast with Daisy Brackenhall. Hello, Keto lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and I've always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. Keto has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again, without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. Welcome to the Keto Woman podcast. Each week I'll be chatting to inspirational women, maybe even the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success so that I can share them with you. So what is keto? Keto is a way of eating that enables you to switch your body's main fuel source from sugar to fat. Who doesn't want to be a fat burner, right? But how do we achieve this? A great place to start is by keeping carbs to 20 grams or less per day. So things like leafy greens and above ground vegetables, plus some nuts and seeds and the incidental carbs you find in things like dairy. Moderate protein scale to your lean body mass and then fat to satiety. Once you're in the swing of things, you can tweak it to suit you. Make your own personalised keto. I'll be asking my guests each week what their keto looks like to show you just how flexible and fabulous this way of eating can be. I'm not a doctor and most of my guests won't be either, so we can't give you medical advice. It's always best to work with your own doctor because they know you and your medical history and so have access to the bigger picture. Please help other people hear about and find this podcast by reviewing the show on iTunes or your podcatcher and the Keto Woman podcast Facebook page. Every star, preferably five of course, and review helps. Here are some reviews from iTunes that I have already. Five stars from Fat Fueled at 50, who you'll know from a recent episode as Debbie Wagner. She left this review back in November before we met. I love this podcast. I started keto in June. It saved my life. Daisy is amazing. Oh, shucks. Thanks, Debbie. Great listening to like-minded people. Keto on, sister. Five stars from Kristen Nicole. This is my new favorite podcast. I love hearing all of these keto women's amazing stories. Keeps me motivated to continue on my keto journey. Five stars from Laney Girl. The best. I listen to many podcasts and yours is by far my favourite. Thanks for keeping it real. Thank you so much, ladies. It really does help get the show in front of more listeners. This week's Extraordinary Woman is Brooke Schumacher. Brooke is a movement teacher and personal trainer who lives in Kirkland, Washington, which is just outside Seattle. When she's not homeschooling her two boys, she can be found walking dogs and walking with friends. She enjoys inspiring others to value walking and teaches restorative exercise to help her clients get better and keep moving as they age. She can be found on Facebook at Coach Brooke and she blogs at GoWalkTheTalk.com. Brooke's love of walking and movement in general is inspiring and I really enjoyed learning from her in this interview. Welcome, Brooke, to the Keto Women podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great, Daisy. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? I'm very good, thanks. Why don't you share a little bit about yourself with the listeners? So, my name is Brooke, and I'm a personal trainer, and I live just outside of Seattle, Washington, um, in Kirkland. And I'm also a homeschool mom and a dog sitter and just really busy and spending a lot of time with my own movement practice. Um, I try to walk a ton and just that's basically what I'm doing. (laughs) Um, I do, I do have personal training clients that I work with and I have a studio in my house. So I'm really lucky that I kind of have set up my little life all sort of on my property with, um, my dog sitting and my personal training and um, to sort of work around my kids that I have here all the time, it seems. Um, Right. Yes, because I think you mentioned you homeschool as well, don't you? I do. I have an eight-year-old and 11-year-old. 
And I guess we sort of unschool because um, I think a lot of people, when they think of homeschool, they picture two desks and a little room where I have curriculum. And that's not really what we do, but um, a lot of people would call it unschooling. But we do do some curriculum. It's just, it's a little more, uh, we work, I work around their interests a little bit more than just sitting them down to do, well, let's just say right there, we don't sit down to do anything because sitting is not something that I spend a lot of time doing. We spend a lot of time moving and walking, um, as a family and we incorporate that into our homeschool and, um, we spend a lot of time outdoors. That's one of their interests. So our homeschool looks a little different than maybe what other people do, but there's also a lot of people out there that unschool and have a different homeschool than what we have. It can kind of be whatever you want, I guess is what I'm saying. So that's interesting. So it's, it's actually a term, is it? Unschooling. I oh, yeah. I haven't heard of it. Yes, it's a term and um, it's a spectrum. I mean, you'll meet people who don't set aside time to teach their kids anything. They just strictly go based off of their interests and wherever it leads them. And um, they sort of almost rebel against that idea of formally teaching their children something out of a book or a curriculum. Um, and then there's people who maybe are more like me, where I do teach them things formally, if you will, but we also follow their interests and we spend a lot of time outside, like I said, and we just sort of make it what we want to. And luckily I live in a state. So in the United States, um, every state is a little different on what you're allowed to do as a homeschooler. And in Washington state, it's pretty liberal, I would say, with what you're allowed to do. There are some requirements you have to follow, but you are in full sort of control of their education if you are homeschooling, which is great because other, other states, I think, have more parameters around what you're supposed to do and they oversee more of what you do, but here they don't. Presumably, there's a certain level of formal goals or formal amounts of information that you're supposed to get over to your children, but you can do it in an informal style. You can deliver it any way you like. Right. Are there, you know, is there is there testing at some point and things like that to see where the kids fit into the typical formal structure? Or again, I suppose it depends which state you're in. It, it depends on the state. There is a requirement um, once a year you are uh, to either test your kids, have them take a standardized test or be evaluated by an employed educator. Um, so they have that evaluation. But the interesting thing is that nobody is allowed to ask you for that information. You keep it in your home file. So there's no kind of comparing to a standard or anything like that. Um, and you are required to teach certain subjects over the course of their entire education. So it doesn't lay it out that in each grade you have to do a certain thing. You can do whatever you want. Whereas in public school, they may be learning, you know, Washington State history at a certain grade. As a homeschooler, you can choose when to introduce that information. So it's a lot more flexible. Right, exactly. And and the delivery is completely down to you, like you were saying, especially with what you do with the movement and your work. You can deliver that information any way in any way you like. So it right. can be while you're, you know, you're having a walk outside or whatever you like. Yes, and we do. I, I mean, we can talk about the work I do, but one of the things that I do that's a little different than... Um, sort of our culture is I don't really sit very much. I don't sit in furniture. I sit on the floor and I try to move my body in as many positions as I can. Um, and so my children are allowed to do the same. I mean, they can do their work if I have work for them anywhere they want because I, I kind of cringe at sitting at a desk in a chair for very much time. I mean, there's nothing wrong with sitting in a chair and doing some work. The problem that we have with our culture is that we spend so much time sitting that it's affecting our health and our bodies, not always in a positive way. So tell me more about that because you've um, you've taken certification. Is that right? I think you... Mm -hmm. um, you gave me some notes. A nutritious movement, is, is that right? Yeah. So, um, 
Many of the listeners have probably heard of uh, Katie Bowman. She's a well-known biomechanist um, and an author, has a very popular podcast herself that she just changed the name to, to move your DNA. Which if, Daisy, if you and I had just met on the street and we were chatting, I would have already told you about Katie Bowman (laughs) because I uh, love her work and um, her book, Move Your DNA, really changed my life. And so I am always sharing that with people because it's kind of hard to explain, but it it makes you think differently about a lot of things and, and about movement in particular. So... She, so was it reading her work or listening to her podcast was, that was that pivotal moment for you to change mm-hmm. and start adopting her principles? Yeah, and- so I heard her on a podcast and then I read her book and then I connected with some of um, some people who had trained with her. Uh, we call ourselves restorative exercise specialists. And like many people, I just sort of immerse myself in her work or what she shares in her books, which is, um, I guess you can call it natural movement. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's really hard for me to explain because I'm not, I'm not the best at taking, um, a big concept and boiling it down into a few sentences. But what I learned from her is, um, how to move sort of through my world in a different way and how to identify things in my own body that maybe weren't, um, working as I would have liked them to. I mean, particularly like I had shoulder pain that I dealt with for a little while and I was able to correct that. So how does that work on a practical basis? Is it something that you have to look at different movements that are sort of laid out in a textbook almost or have been taught to you, right, you should be moving this way and compare that to how you are moving and work out, oh, yes, that's why, you know, I've got a problem. And you then you have to consciously move in a in a different way that's the better way? Or is it more individual than that, a mixture of both? How does it actually work in a in a practical way? How did you go from having that shoulder pain mm-hmm. to figuring out what to do to change that? There are specific corrective exercises that I teach um, to my clients that sometimes might look like a stretch or a movement to sort of show them, um, for example, because you type on your computer a lot and because as a human living in our culture, your hands are in front of you a lot, your arm is doing this internal rotation constantly. And so your body has sort of shaped to this um, position and that that could be causing you... Um, pain or tightness of certain muscles. And here are some things you can do to start changing that. And that would be maybe a corrective exercise, along with saying to someone, you know, let's look at what you do all day long. For example, you have your hands in front of you on the computer a lot. Um, What could you do differently all day long? to help change that. So it's, it's the idea of, yes, there are some exercises specific that we can teach, but then it's looking at what are you doing all day long that's creating this body that you're in and what do you want to do to change it? Um, sometimes I tell people, um, what I teach is the importance of walking and, um, why we should value that movements and exercises to help you walk better. Um, what we don't, we don't say there's, there's wrong ways of doing things, um, necessarily. It's more, you know, what are your goals? And, uh, let me show you some things that I can see in your body that maybe you're doing all the time that are causing things to happen. And it's, it is hard to explain, especially without, showing someone that makes perfect sense so you basically you take the individual Uh and you see what problems they have and you give them some corrective restorative type movements that they can do Uh to help rebalance the problem Uh but you also go at the root of the cause Uh to see what they're doing on a daily basis that's 
leading them to those right. problems that you're trying to correct and try and stop it, you know, at the source. Right. And the overall concept of what I do with restorative exercise is helping people uh, learn about themselves. So just sort of being a conduit for them to learn what's going on in their body. It's sort of highlighting to them things and then having them have this sort of aha moment. Or I can show a client something they're doing with their rib cage that is really common. We call it thrusting their ribs or well, we call it thrusting the ribs. Um, and I can show them how to bring their ribs back into a better aligned position, but it could take them a year to really have that cement in their head what it really means. It can be a long process for it all to come together. So it's a little different than just, you know, taking s the concept of having someone come in for an hour and showing them these five things they can take home. Um, because it is a, it's a, it's a process. Um, and the people who've worked with me for several years, I've seen them go through this process. And, um, and, and so now I'm kind of used to them. They'll come in and, you know, after six months of learning something and they'll say, I finally understand, you know, what I was doing before and how this has affected me. That must be really rewarding when that happens. It when, is. When it's when very you rewarding. You see that switch. Mm -hmm. And then I'm feeling rewarded with the changes I've made in, in myself. Like I, I feel so lucky that I was able to learn that I had these movement patterns that I was completely unaware of. Um, and I was able to start making corrections to them before I was 70 years old. But even at the age of 70, 80, you can, you can still make changes. Um, in fact, Katie has a book out with some women who are in their 70s and 80s who've been working with her for over a decade. It's called Dynamic Aging. And they were able to make some huge changes in their body at later in life. Um, so it's never too late, but I am thankful that I didn't continue with, there were certain things I was doing that I look back and I was like, how did I not know <laughs> um, that was a problem in my body before? So, And um, what a great thing to be able to set up in your kids. So, you know, really right at the start of their lives, you can, mm -hmm. you know, stop problems happening later on by just instilling the the right way to move for them right which I guess this gets into kind of the walking part of my story but um with my kids it really comes down to allowing them to move as much as possible and and instilling in them the value of walking that's sort of what I've become in my community a little bit is sort of an ambassador for walking or that's what I feel like I'm becoming with people coming to me and chatting with me and talking to me on social media about all my walking because in our culture walking isn't valued and I want to sort of be an, an ambassador for lack of a better word to share with people it is extremely valuable and necessary and in fact a biological imperative for humans that if you can walk if you're not disabled and you actually can walk then we should. And so I do teach my kids that. I mean, I didn't always. This was something I learned when they were probably five and eight. I started walking more with them and it became like a, a um, you know, an actual thing that we focused on and that we did. And, um, and now I, now I teach that to parents. You know, I'll have parents say to me, oh, my kid's not interested in sports and I don't know what to do. And, and I say, that's okay, because you know what? Sports, while they're great in so many ways and, and kids get so much benefit from them, um, as far as like a body health perspective, many times they're causing injuries. And what children and well, all humans need to do is, is walk and carry that into their adulthood. Because, you know, I played a lot of sports as a kid, but I'm not running around on the tennis court and, you know... I'm not swimming laps in the pool. I don't know what else I did. Water, I'm not water skiing, but I can go for a walk every single day. And actually, it's my belief that walking is the most nutritious, if you will, movement that there is. So, so I tell people, you know, don't feel bad that your kid doesn't want to play a sport. It's, 
take them on a walk and, and get them excited about it. You know, my kids did a hundred mile walking challenge when I first started getting them to walk more and we tracked all of our miles. And when we reached a hundred miles, we did something fun. I don't remember what it was. Um, and then sl- in that hundred mile challenge that we did, they got so much better at walking and just having a good time. And, you know, it wasn't a big deal. They could walk five miles and it was fine. That's the thing, isn't it? And that's, that's the benefit with your, I was going to say homeschooling, unschooling, <laughs> is that you can find something that they like to do. I, I mean, I, I'm one of those kids who hated sports at school. I mm-hmm. really, I mean, I loathed it. If I could possibly get a sick note to get out of hockey or netball or athletics were probably the worst. All of them, you know, absolutely hated it. But I've come to realize that there are some forms of exercise that I genuinely enjoy. You know, I, I like swimming. I like dancing. I've, you know, recently discovered that I actually, I quite like running, which is a totally alien concept to me. But, um, you know, doing this couch to 5k thing, I actually, you know, I enjoy it getting out there and moving. And that's, you know, it's, it's walking and running combined. Mm-hmm. And I really think that there is some form of movement that everyone will enjoy doing. Mm-hmm. It might just be and probably will be different from the ones you're kind of forced into doing at school but the problem is with being forced into doing something at school you think I hate sports I hate exercise Mm. I hate the whole thing I don't want to do any of it Mm -hmm. which of course is is never the case I mean I you know everyone likes moving in some ways even if you know how many kids don't like dancing at a disco you know that's that that absolutely dates me I'm sure just (laughs) using the word disco but you know what I mean Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's always some kind of movement isn't it Mm -hmm. that everyone likes so it's really finding what it is and you know you've got the absolute advantage there with being able to let them let them do whatever they like movement wise right and I mean you want you you want me to I mean hearing you say all that I want to talk with you about why walking is so good and even in many cases better than um, you know, most other forms of exercise. And I'll just talk about kids for a second. Um, when kids are growing up, so when they start walking all the way through their young adult years, that's when they're building a base of bone that they'll carry for the rest of their life. And the way that you build your bone mass is from walking. It's that heel strike on the ground that sends a message to your bones to build bone. It's super important for kids to walk. Um, and that may mean, you know, the parent taking them to school parks just around the block from the school and gets them to walk in. Or it may mean they walk to school from their house. Whatever it is, it, it can be very small to start. But I, I don't think people really know that, that it's that important. Um well, I know they don't because I don't see very many kids regularly walking to school where I live just because parents don't know. And it's, it's even more important or it's, it's even, um, more beneficial for the bone building properties than say biking to school. Because when you're cycling, you're not having that weight come down through your leg. It's, it's different. It's a completely different movement. Biking is not a biological imperative. Biking is fun and, you know, a rite of passage for children. Um, and, and what I, what I would say is, and they still need to walk a lot. <laughs> um, but you're right, as a homeschooler, because I do have these, you know, strong opinions or I've learned these things, I can just directly pass that along to my kids and they do know and it's sort of like science because they know all of this and they can tell you all of this because I've told them on our walks (laughs) we play a game um we play hunter gatherer and they get annoyed with me they're like are we gonna play that hunter gatherer game again and (laughs) because I'll say you know let's carry this stick and what are we gonna go do we're going to we're we might be going to the grocery store but I'll say we're gonna go find our food and I'll say, let's look for prey and we'll look far away because that's really good for your eyes um, to look off in the distance, which is one reason why being in nature is really good for you. And so we'll we'll play little games with it. Um, 
And even though they don't like to admit it, they are learning through all of that process that I put them through. That's that's fascinating. I remember actually when years ago I went for an eye test and they told me I needed uh, reading glasses. And I used them for a while and, and I was thinking, well, you know, I, I'm not really getting the benefit from these I don't I don't know do I do I need them are they working went to a different opticians and he told me no you don't need reading glasses you you just need to train the muscles in your eyes a bit more mm. and what made me think of it mm-hmm. was that you talking about looking into the distance and the exercise he gave me was exactly that he said you know hold your finger up in front of you like I don't know what whatever 50 30 50 centimeters away and you focus on that and then you focus on a spot that you see in the distance Mm -hmm. and you go back to your finger and you go back to the distance you go back and forth so don't do it too much at once because it makes you feel a bit sick and it does (laughs) (laughs) but he said you you do that regularly do that every day Mm -hmm. and you'll you'll notice a difference Mm -hmm. spot on It, it and that made the difference the glasses, what you know, weren't working for me, hmm. and and you know, weren't making the difference. But that really did. So it's it's fascinating hearing you talking about it, and the way you put it into a game, or you put it in. But you also you're explaining why they're doing these things. You're giving them, you know, the the science behind it, which certainly would have appealed to me as a child because I was one of those, hmm. um, you know, sometimes irritating children who always. But why? You know, but why do I need to do that? Why, why, why all the time? So mm. having someone tell you, well, this is why, <laughs> right. and this is the benefit it's going to have for you as you as you grow up. Uh, you know, I think I think that's fantastic because I love talking about this stuff so much. My poor children, they're like, I have a reason because I'm teaching them, so I can tell them <laughs> everything I learn in my studies um, with nutritious movement and otherwise, and they're sort of my captive audience. I. I mean, I love sharing this information with, with anyone, um, but I don't unless they ask me. You know, I don't, I wouldn't tell somebody I see on a hike, oh, make sure you're looking far away because that's really going to relax your eyes and, you know, when you're inside in your office, you don't ever get to do that because you're looking at the wall. And that's what it is too. If school children who don't get to go outside very much or office workers, your eyes change because you're not getting that distance view. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. And I know um, that often in in some offices and things, you have signs, don't you, saying, you know, what you should do if you work on a computer, for example, Mm -hmm. all the time, every 15 minutes, you should just look around your immediate environment you know once every hour you're supposed to you know get up and walk around and and by the sounds of it a good thing to do would be to go and look out a window exactly. into the distance come back and sit down but yep. if you were to do those things regularly it would improve presumably not only your eyes but actually just the movement of walking around is going to perhaps you know perhaps some where you were saying about um, the way you sit at a computer and I know with me it depends how I'm sitting but I can totally see that rolling the shoulders forwards and mm-hmm. it's often my neck gets pushed into an awkward mm-hmm. position just that if you are aware of that and those those moments when you get up and walk around you if you rolled your shoulders mm-hmm. around or something did some stretches right. I can see how that would really improve your posture and and how you performed in the workplace ultimately you know it's great for everyone isn't it and you can't because people who do that kind of work if that's their job that's that's the environment they have to be in all the time they can't just suddenly not be doing that anymore Mm -hmm. so it's presumably just finding ways of of making that better right and you know if I was consulting that person who worked at Microsoft and sat at their desk all day, as I have consulted, because I, I live near Microsoft and Facebook and Google, and we have a lot of tech workers here. Um, the first thing I encourage all of them to do is I've had managers who I've worked with who I say, can you walk for some of your meetings? And they say, well, yeah, actually, I can. I didn't even think of that. Um, because when you walk, it's one of the few times that your arm actually goes behind you. And so just walking can help alleviate some of that shoulder tension that you develop, that we all develop over time. Um, so it, it can be just something very simple, like getting up, like you said, but 
you know, I'm big on the walking, so I'm going to say, can you walk? But what a fantastic idea. So, yeah, that 10-minute meeting we've got at 12 o'clock, let's go for a walk Mm -hmm. and and have the meeting as we walk. Unless there's a particular reason you need to be in the office. Yeah, and it's hard because… What a great idea. The culture, the culture that we live in, and I'm sure the cor- corporate culture at a lot of places is not set up in a way that everybody's just walking around doing stuff like that. So you feel influenced. It, it makes you more sedentary because not very many people are moving very much. And I feel that. So I move a ton and, um, like when I go to a doctor's office, I'm not sitting in the furniture. I'm usually kneeling on the floor or squatting or standing. Um, but I am always the only person who's not sitting in a chair. And, and so you get extra attention when you're, when you're doing that and not everybody's comfortable with that. It sort of makes you stand out. Um, I'm somewhat used to it now, but that's just one example of the many things that I do. <laughs> That, Quite a good um, conversation starter, though. I should imagine sometimes. You know what? Yeah. I wish people would ask me, but uh, really, but they don't. They I was going to say sometimes. Sometimes it'll just be a bit awkward, and no one says anything. But I would have thought that sometimes someone would ask you, "Well, what? You know, why? Are you, why are you doing that? Why are you doing squats in the middle of the office?" Or what they tend to say if they're going to say something, because this does happen. Are you okay? Are, are you okay? Is everything all right? Like. Um, sometimes I'll go to the end of my driveway and wait for a client and I'll squat just on the curb. And I've had people walking by come over and they're really concerned. And, and I, I get it, but I do chuckle because, you know, there's plenty of places in the world where squatting is just a part of their natural everyday movement. It's just not here. And it should be. Squatting is really good for you. And, um, And many people have just lost the ability to do any sort of squat beyond sitting in a chair and standing up. So, but great opportunity to, you know, to share what you're doing. So when that, you know, when that person does come over and say that, well, no, actually, I'm doing this intentionally because blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I'll say most people don't really want to hear my. (laughs) (laughs) You never know. know It it might stick with somebody. No, I know. If they know me, they know, but. Um, but I've learned to not really give them more information because it might put them off a little bit. So I know what you mean. It's, it's a similar thing in the keto community, isn't it? You don't want to come across too evangelical. It's very similar to keto. And actually, I like to make an analogy about walking and keto because, you know, I think a lot of people who do keto think of it as like the simplest, healthiest, like most intuitive way to eat. That why didn't I think of this before or why did I ever think, you know, I needed all these carbs. This is working so well for me. And that is very much like how I feel about walking. Walking is the, I mean, it can be. I do understand that not everybody can walk and that's sort of a different thing. But um, but it can be the simplest, most basic healthiest, most nutritious way to move your body. Um, And then I also like to say, you know, much like with a diet, you can say, if you can tolerate carbs, great, good on you. You know, I'm not going to say you shouldn't eat carbs if that works for you. And see, I would say the same thing about like cycling um, or swimming, you know, that's great if you can tolerate that, if your pelvic floor can tolerate riding a bike that much and you can be in a sitting position even more than you already are. Good on you and it's fun and it's social and you get a lot of pleasure out of it. Like I'm never going to say you shouldn't do those things, but I am going to say walking is super important. Just like you might say, you know, it's great that you can tolerate carbs, but you should still probably eat healthy fat and protein and, um, and probably not have high fructose corn syrup um, type of carbs. So I, I like to think of this little analogy because um, one thing I see in the keto forum or just online is people who are getting comfortable with a keto diet and then saying, wow, I really feel like exercising. What should I do? And um, I'll see people post videos and um, do this work out and why don't you try yoga and and I think these people feel 
well, obviously they don't, they don't really know what to do for a quote unquote workout. Um, but it's really just so simple t- t- to me. Mm-hmm. It's just, you should walk. Go for a walk. Start there and then maybe add in whatever else you might want to do. But, you know, it's, it's overwhelming to go to a gym and think of what to do. And it's expensive. And it's expensive. But, you know, you can go to the gym and get on the treadmill. Well, if you're going to get on the treadmill, I have a specific thing I would recommend that you do, which is to, uh, turn the incline up really high and go slower because your gait pattern, when you set the treadmill in that way, is going to be more like walking on natural ground than if you get on it flat and go really fast. Your gait pattern completely changes and it's not doing what... Um, naturally walking on the ground would do for you. Oh, that's interesting. How does that work? Because, you know, you would assume that walking on the flat on the treadmill is like walking on the flat Mm -hmm. in reality, but... Let me see how I can explain this in my layman's terms because I'm a complete layman when I regurgitate the things I learn. But when you walk on the ground, ideally you're going to be pushing yourself forward. So you're pushing, pushing, pushing with your legs and your arm actually that swings back is almost like rowing you through the air. When you get on a treadmill and it's flat and you're going fast, you're not pushing, you're lifting your leg and your arms are in, your arms are swinging in front of you instead of behind you. So it's almost like you reverse your gait pattern and that lifting of the leg is, um, how do I say this, is reinforcing the same pattern that you have when you sit in a chair. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, it is. It makes sense, actually, because it's obvious when you think about it, Mm -hmm. that it's completely different. Because when you walk on the ground, it's not moving underneath you. (laughs) And specifically, so most people are pretty weak in their in their posterior chain so all the muscles running up the back of their body especially their hamstrings and their glutes um, because we don't use those muscles very often so when I say I I help people and I coach them and I teach them exercises to help them walk better we try to start using those muscles for what they're for which is for walking because some people when they walk they're not actually pushing because they are not using those muscles and ideally to get the most benefit from walking, to um, to use the most musculature when you're walking, you want to be using the muscles to push yourself forward. And how can you tell that? So how can I tell? Right, so if I go out for a walk now, how can I tell if I'm well, walking to the best of my ability, as it were? It's it's a little nuanced, um, and I am still learning some of that because it. it Not only does it take years to learn in your own body things you're doing, it takes many years to become an effective movement teacher. Um, So some of my colleagues are much more experienced at, you know, looking at your gait pattern and identifying certain things you're doing. But, I mean, I guess the, the thing I would say is you don't really need to worry about it. If you're not walking right now to anybody out there, if you're not going for a walk and you know that you can walk to your mailbox or walk around the block or walk around your yard, then just do that. And let's say somebody has foot pain, because this is another common thing. You know, if you have foot pain that's preventing you from walking, then if it were me, I would do everything to try to fix that foot pain um, so that you can walk. So I guess I would just say, You don't necessarily have to worry whether or not you're doing it right. Um, But if you do want to learn more about what you can do, then you can start looking, reading Katie Bowman's work. Move Your DNA is a great starting point going on her website, Nutritious Movement. There's so much to learn. Um, And there are some really basic exercises like a calf stretch that she teaches in almost all of her books because it's so fundamental to... Um, making some positive changes um, in your body and to help you walk better. Yeah, and I certainly think that, you know, there are things you can be aware of. I know, I mean, I always get into research, whatever I'm starting to do or whatever even I'm thinking about doing, I always I always get into research mode. But mm-hmm. I know when I started doing this, this Couch to 5K, I was looking about, um, you know, posture and and 
actually, a lot of the things they talk about with your posture, I was finding, you know, that I was just naturally doing. And I mm. remember things, you know, my brother had told me about, um, you know, it's it's not a great idea to take great long strides. It's better to take shorter strides mm-hmm. and have, you know, when, when your foot hits the floor for it to be doing, for it to be doing that underneath you so you're using things like mm-hmm. your center of gravity and and all those sort of little technical details it's, it's it's quite nice sort of reading about them isn't it and then just being aware of it next mm-hmm. time mm-hmm. you go out and walk or run or whatever it is you're doing just sort of being a little bit aware of of what they were saying about posture as as you're doing it and it's i can remember i know when you when you were speaking about the um importance of walking as you're developing bones and you mentioned that heel strike and i know that's something that's often mentioned with running that is not a good thing but right so different when you're walking exactly so running i would say does not e- does not use as many muscles as walking um it's a completely different thing um uh, Because especially if you're going to wear a more minimal shoe, you're going to be running without that heel strike. You're going to be taking a smaller stride and running more on your forefoot. Kind of like what you were saying, you were researching those types of things. And and walking is so different because when I think of running, there's more technique involved sometimes. But walking, is it's not technique necessarily. It's looking at sort of that same thing of how you've sort of your body has changed over time into having certain patterns. So one of the patterns that people have, this would be something that I could easily identify and you can identify when you see people is they walk with their toes pointed out. So we might call that sort of duck footed in, in American culture. I don't know what they call it in the UK. Do they call it duck footed when you walk with your feet? Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) And that is something people develop over time. Straight feet is more ideal because you're loading your bones in the way that your body is sort of set up to be loaded. But the thing is, if somebody's walking with their feet turned out, it's not a simple turn your feet straight ahead all of the time because there's all sorts of, well, there's bones that have moved to create that pattern. Um, And so it may take, you know, a year or many years to really get that a little bit corrected or all the way corrected, or they may have to continue walking like that until the end of time. So when I work with clients, you know, we'll identify, you know, if they have, sometimes someone will have one foot that turns out more than the other. And um, you have to then look from the feet up at what's causing that. But what's interesting is someone like me, when you learn the work and when I teach my clients this stuff, suddenly now you notice everybody's feet. Who's standing with straight feet? Who's got their feet turned out? I do like little, I don't know, I play sort of games with it where I've been to tourist places and I'll notice all the people with their feet turned out and then there'll be one person with straight feet and I'll kind of check them out and I determine they did not grow up in our culture. They're from, you know, I don't know, Indonesia or something. And so they were not influenced by the same things that I'm influenced by here um, because it is it is a really common thing. Um, and then it's interesting when I hang out with all the people who are doing the same work I'm doing, they all have these straight <laughs> feet. And it's just that's just not what you see in everyday life. So it's kind of fun to kind of... And I'll have clients come back and they say, oh, I went home and my husband and my mother and everybody, they got these feet turned out. And and then I tell them, well, actually, what happens is you pass that down to your children. So as a mom, if you're standing with this one foot turned out on one hip, that kind of posture, you actually just pass that right down to your kids and they start doing it. So luckily, I started this work before my kids were very old, and so I can look at them and and see that they they stand a little straighter than some of, you know, maybe some of their peers do because that's the influence I'm giving them. It's it's fascinating. It yeah, it really is. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell me a bit about how you came to find this and how you also came to find keto because. Mm-hmm. I think you've mentioned to me before that both your exercise and your food were very different 
if we go back 10 years or something to the way they look now. So, you know, what was it like before and what led you to make those changes? So with my diet, until I was probably my early 30s, I didn't really have to worry about gaining weight. So I was a lean child. Um, I could eat as many carbs as I wanted. I could eat ice cream. That was one of my favorite foods, pizza. Just, and it would not affect me at all. Well, visibly affect me. I'm sure it did affect me. And I was an athlete. I was a runner. Um, and then I hit my early 30s and I, that's when I think I started becoming a little insulin resistant. So I started putting on a little bit of weight and um, had my children. And then, oh, when I was pregnant, oh my gosh, when I was pregnant, I gained over 60 pounds each time and had 10 pound babies. And that took a toll on my, I'm sure, on my insulin resistance. I never tested positive for diabetes when I was pregnant, but I think I was. I just don't think they did the right testing. Um, so after that, I did struggle with losing weight. Um, but I never had any tests done to check my HbA1c or anything like that. So that was, you know, I was like 40. Um, and then my one of my sons, we determined he has celiac. So we eliminated gluten from our home. And I did see some improvements in me. Um, and then I got kind of turned on to the paleo diet. And I did see some benefits. Um, but I didn't really stick with it because I didn't have any uh, doctor or anyone else telling me I should do this other than my own research. Um and it was hard because when you have kids eating carbs and you don't have a real definitive reason to give them up, it's really easy to slip back into eating carbs. Plus, I went through a really stressful time, probably for about six years, just a, a, like every stress you can imagine. My younger son was born with a health condition and he had to go to the children's hospital right after he was born. And... Then we had financial stress, and it just all piled on. But I don't think I really saw the effects of that until like six years later. So this was last year after we got a lot of things figured out with my stress levels at home and with my kids. Everything was kind of coming together to be a little more stable. I finally went to my naturopath, and I said, I want you to check my HbA1c because I think, I think it's probably elevated. And sure enough, it was five six, five point six, which I did not. I was not in. I was like, "What? This, this is not good." So I immediately went back to low carb keto, and it's exactly what I needed to hear because up until that point, I think I could say to myself, "Well, I'm this athlete. You know, I grew up as a lean kid, and I was a thin person for a really long time, and I just didn't. I don't think I wanted to believe that I had insulin resistance." So. I do, and I did, and then I got that confirmation from her, so I went back on keto. She believes I'm hypothyroid and had a couple other things going on, so she gave me some supplements and some thyroid medication, which I know can be kind of controversial, but I took it, and it's made a huge difference for me, just huge. It's a very low dose that I'm taking. So kind of that all came together. I went back on keto. I have two friends who also do keto. We were doing fasting at the same time and really supporting each other. And then I was able to start walking because prior to that, because of what was going on at home, I couldn't even really leave my house to go for a 15-minute walk. So I do understand what it's like to not be able to do much movement because I was there and it was really tough. Um, but once I kind of got the clearance to just go and I had the space and the time I just did it and then I had this goal so that was in June and I just started thinking maybe in November I can do a long walk to kind of culminate my journey back into keto and all my walking and and I did but so I was able to lose almost 20 pounds when I went back on keto 
my HbA1c came down a little bit, so it came down to 5, only to 5.5 the last time we checked, but I'm due to check it again right now. Um, so I wish I had done that before we talked because I'm, I'm hoping it went down some more. My naturopath said as long as it's trending down, that's what we want. Um, I was going to say that's what you're looking for, isn't it? Yeah. Is a trend downwards. It's not necessarily going to do it as fast as you would like to, but as long as it keeps moving down. Which is another wake-up call. You know, it's not, <laughs> which keeps me, you know, on track. I told my friends, now that I've had this almost pre-diabetic HbA1c, I'm not tempted to eat things that my kids are eating anymore so yeah really it's a really good motivation isn't it knowing what can happen if that trend is going the other way mm -hmm. and I had no idea no doctor had ever tested that on me um it should be standard shouldn't it it's it's, it's the kind of test that you know you should at least be having say you know once every five years but really every year to just as a health check that you know this is what's going on with you it's it, it's such a good indicator of Absolutely. Absolutely. My, because I'm sure before then it was a problem. So yeah, I agree. And so what does your keto look like on a, you know, on a day to day basis? Um, so in the morning, I usually have decaf coffee with MCT oil powder and cream, heavy cream. Sometimes I won't do the MCT oil. I just kind of do whatever I feel like. I don't have like a strict regimen of any kind. Um, but I typically don't eat breakfast. Um, and then usually around one or two, I'll have leftovers or whatever's in the fridge. Um, I tend to just stock a whole bunch of keto stuff. I'll go through phases like for a, quite a while. I really liked goat brie cheese on cucumber slices. Like that was just all the time I was having that because it was like my favorite thing. Um, I'm like that. I do that. You eat it all the time until you're absolutely sick of it and uh -huh. then you can't eat it again for six months. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Like the other day I got some liverwurst from one of those online grass-fed companies and I was eating that for a few days for lunch. It was really good. Um, and then for dinner, it'll usually just be, you know, I don't know. It's usually like a meat, like a or salmon, or I'll cook a whole chicken in my Instant Pot, or um, I just started making steaks. So I did try to do a little bit of the carnivore or zero-carb animal-based thing, um, which was good because I finally learned how to cook a steak because I'm not a big steak cooker. Um, I did light one on fire one day, too. but So that was fun. That was interesting. That was a whole other like, experiment that I did. Um, so that's about it. I mean, I, I used to make more like fat bombs and I think that's more what you do when you're transitioning a little bit. Um, but what I found and with my friends, sometimes those are triggers to overeat um, or to hide maybe why you're eating because you can just pop a fat bomb instead of, you know, do I feel stress or am I tired? So I don't tend to make a lot of those anymore. I've sort of simplified down to not making a lot of crazy stuff. Although I still make cheesecake in my Instant Pot. And one of the reasons is my kid loves it. And he can't, I mean, he can't have gluten, but we don't have gluten anyway. But um, I make, you know, obviously a gluten-free keto cheesecake, and it's really good. So I've, I've heard they're good in the... In this magical thing called the Instapot, yes. which uh, oh, you don't, I don't have, have here, but <laughs> <laughs> they do sound pretty amazing. I think pretty well everyone goes through that phase of all the alternatives and the baked goods and, and things like that, it's, especially if you quite like cooking. It's just, it's partially just the experimentation, I think, and and just getting into that experimenting and, and cooking things and making these fabulous things that you perhaps didn't think you'd be able to have. And mm -hmm. it's, it's the kind of thing that I'll do, you know, when I've got people coming for dinner or something like that. But I basically can't be bothered to do it on a, on a daily basis yeah. is, is what it comes down to. And why you end up, like you're saying, just, just eating really quite simply. Because it's just easier, isn't it? <laughs> it's easier, and I have been trying to walk so much that it I've not been doing as much of that stuff because my focus is elsewhere. Um, 
But you're exactly right. It's really fun to do all that when you're first doing it because you can make the exact same thing, but it's low carb. And with my friends, we'll say, oh, I made the keto rolls and they're so good. And then the next day we're like, but I realized I ate three of them because they are so good and it triggered me. And so I'm not making them for another couple of weeks or something. Yeah, that's a real common problem, isn't it? I'm like that with some crackers. I make, I make some fabulous you know, seed crackers and they are delicious and they go down an absolute storm with non-keto people who, who come for dinner. But I like them a bit too much. And so I just don't make them very often because when I do, they get eaten pretty quickly with, you know, right. with whatever, with cheese or pate or slabs of butter and marmite, what, you know, whatever it is. But, <laughs> but I do, it is that tendency with something that either actually is fairly carby or just reminds you of the old carby foods that mm -hmm. you ate. And it just tips over, doesn't it? That balance with, you know, the moderate amount that you'd have with the, with other simpler foods right to to eating too much totally. and you know a friend a friend of mine kim says i think she says about things like cookies and what have you she said if i can't stop at two in a day then i know that's a problem food yeah i need to not make it yeah okay so tell me a bit about your transition from the running athlete that you were to walking, what made you decide to make that change? Was it the training you were doing that came first that led you, that then made you change your mind to to walk, or did the walking come before the training? Or you know how did how did that work? Well, the first thing that happened is I switched from running as my primary exercise practice to lifting heavy weights. So for a period of time, I was power lifting on my own. Um, I wasn't doing CrossFit or anything like that, which that's not really power lifting, but so I got really into weightlifting, um, which now I know made some of my issues I was having worse, um, that I hadn't identified yet. Um, so I was doing a lot of power lifting and then I transitioned to being a trainer because I, really enjoyed weightlifting and wanted to share that with my friends and clients. And so I was still sprinting. I wasn't doing a lot of long distance running. I was just sort of sprinting, but I wasn't doing a lot of walking. And then a lot of my clients were having pain of various sorts. And I thought, oh, I need to refer them to a physical therapist. And what am I going to do? How, do? how do personal trainers manage this problem? And then I discovered restorative exercise, um, which didn't solve all the problems, but it really helped me help my clients. And then, well, and from the restorative exercise and the nutritious movement paradigm, I learned why walking is so important. Um, and when, when you become a restorative exercise specialist, you learn that humans as we evolved, would walk like five to 10 miles every day. So if we we're going to mimic that, then, and I'm trying to teach my clients the importance of walking, then trying to mimic that amount of walking could be a really good thing. So I was walking before I got my certification, but then after my certification, because I had the time to put into more walking, I wanted to sort of mimic that which sounds like a like a huge amount of miles to anyone I think but it's more the time that you put in it's it's having the time to do it more than it being taxing on the body really so that was a, the evolution and I did give up heavy weightlifting um when I was training to be a restorative exercise specialist because it wasn't doing all good things to my body I have returned to lifting weights, but I don't do the same kind of weightlifting that I was doing before. Um, so, yeah. So, then once I I sort of completed my certification, became more dedicated to walking, that's when I came up with these goals that I had and just went for it. And keto was a huge part of helping me because I just felt so good <laughs> and still do. 
So tell us about this recent goal that you hit because uh, that was quite a big one, wasn't it? I turned 48 last November and I had been saying to myself, I really want to do a long walk. What could I do? Could I just, maybe I'll just walk 24 miles, two days in a row. Could I do that? Is that even possible? That's almost two marathons. And so I had these ideas running through my head and um, I just kept walking and walking and walking. And on the weekend I would walk longer. I'd walk 10 miles and 15. And then I I said, well, I'm going to try to walk 20 and just see how that goes. It went well. And then I said, well, I know I can do 20. So let me do another 20 miler and then the next day do a 10 miler and see if I recover from that okay. And it went great. So I decided for my birthday I was going to do 24 miles two days in a row to equal 48 miles to culminate my 48th birthday. But what happened was it was a gorgeous sunny day in November. It was like spring here. And anybody who lives in Seattle knows if it's like 50 degrees or warmer and the sun's out, everybody's wearing shorts and playing in the water practically. So I just set out on that day and I said, well, I'm just going to go as far as I can. And, you know, long story short, I just kept going and I walked 48 miles in one day over 12 hours. And I felt great. I didn't I mean, I was really stunned in a way how good I felt. I mean, I've run marathons before and I've done, you know, intense athletic endeavors. And this was just like a long, tough thing, but I wasn't sore the next day. Um, I recovered really quickly and I, I attribute that to keto. I didn't get hungry on the walk, although I did eat. I took some food, just I didn't want to really fast the whole time. I, I don't think that would have been smart. But um, I was running on fat for sure because I didn't really need anything. I, I ate some macadamia nuts and some cheese um, and, of course, plenty of fluid. But it really allowed me to do more than I ever thought possible. Um, and I was I was totally amazed. I mean, I was really surprised the next day when I woke up and I wasn't even sore. I felt, I felt very tired. I told my friends I felt like I'd given birth, but I didn't have a baby. It was that same sort of exhausted, just want to lay in bed all day feeling. Um, I'm even more dedicated to keto after that experience. It seems to be a recurrent theme mm. with anyone who does any kind of endurance sport on keto, that not only does it make the sport itself easier they don't have you know these problems with you know hitting the wall with marathons or bonking as you call it in america mm -hmm. um but it's the recovery that people really seem to talk about that it's just so much easier you don't have to necessarily take the great long periods of rest that you would have had to do before as a carb burner it seems to really really make a difference being on keto the recovery yeah, I I fully agree, and I would not even have realized how um, incredible it was had I not done that. It's almost like I feel, it's sort of silly to say, but I feel unstoppable. I mean, so in January, I decided to set a new goal. On the first Tuesday in January, I walked 20 miles just sort of because I just had the time, and so I ended up doing 20 miles, and I thought, well, maybe I'll do that next Tuesday. So I did it again the next week, and then I I just did my third one, um, and the day before I just did the third one, I also climbed a mountain, and then the next day I walked 20 miles, and I'm just like, I probably could have gone further, but I didn't have enough time. It's amazing to me, and I'm not saying that I'm some superhuman. It's, it's just I've put in the time, and keto has allowed me to stay healthy in a lot of ways, and I also want to add, it's not that I think anybody else needs to walk 20 miles once a week or even you know, six or 10, you don't have to do that. But you also don't need to think you need to do high intensity boot camp training that is going to make you feel like you can't get up off the floor when you're done in order to be healthy and active and go through your keto journey. Because I think that, you know, the exercise mentality of taking a really hard class or taking a, you know, I don't want to like throw any classes under the bus, but it doesn't have to be super taxing on you. It can be just walking and just go as far as you can. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I, you know, some people thrive 
on that and those kind of classes and absolutely love it. But other people, me, um, (laughs) find them just a little bit overwhelming. And the problem is, if you find something overwhelming, if you think something's going to be too taxing, often the tendency is just not to do it at all. Right. So like you say, just go for a walk, just do something that you think is almost too easy. Well, that's not that's that we can't classify that as exercise because it's not, you know, absolutely exhausting yourself in right. a in a high intensity exercise class. So it it doesn't count, but yeah, it very much does. And it and it's a great thing to do. And it's I you know, I, I think a lot of people say that the the thing that makes the real difference is incorporating something in your daily or as near to daily life as possible. A much, you know, lower intensity that you can throw into every day. You make that change, you know, from for now and till forever. That's going to have much more impact than signing up for an exercise class or the gym and really going at it full steam for three months and then giving up. Right. It's just like keto. It's just like take grains and sugar, just take all of that out of your diet and focus on, you know, if you like vegetables and meat, just keep it simple and keep going, right? Mm, Make it sustainable. Make it sustainable. And, you know, I would also add... For me, too, it's not even about exercise because it's really what we do all day long. The, you know, getting up out of our chairs, sitting on the floor, moving because you, you know, exercise might only be one hour out of 24 hour day. And that's not having the biggest impact on your body. It's really what you're doing the rest of the time um, for the rest of your life. So, so yeah, it. Just keep it simple and keep going, <laughs> really. And so tell us briefly how to find you, the the name of your website and, and things like that. So my blog, which details my walking journey a little bit more, is called GoWalkTheTalk.com. And then on Facebook, I'm Coach Brooke. And on Instagram, I'm Coach Brooke Movement. I do post things on there like little tips and movements that you can add in just fun stuff because I have learned that way too all my movement colleagues teach me stuff every day on their social media and um, it's fun great well we'll yeah we'll list that in the show notes and also um, some of the resources you talked about Katie Bowman and things like that we'll put all the details in the show notes so people can find them easily so I have a feeling I might know what it's going to be or certainly roughly what it's going to be, but (laughs) what would be your top tip? Um, You know, I think it's, it's to come up with a goal. So mine was walking 48 miles, but come up with sort of a non-scale victory type of goal that you might have. Um, And the reason I say that is having that goal in mind for my, birthday, it gave me um, motivation and structure and my own accountability to accomplish it. Um, so I, like right now I have this January of goal of walking 20 miles every Tuesday and that's, that motivates me. Um, your goal could be to walk with your family three times a week. And then it also helps if you share that goal with someone else. Like I've done with my friends, we'll have little things we're doing together. And I had friends who walked with me to help me get to my goal. It helps to have that community of people around you. Fabulous. Great tip. (laughs) Well, thanks very much for talking to me today, Brooke. It's, It's been fantastic. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Daisy. Great. To get the resources and links from the show, please go to ketowomanpodcast.com. Are you my next extraordinary woman? Maybe you've got an idea for a show, a topic you want to hear about. Let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. 
If you fancy joining me on this exciting adventure and want to help me create new episodes, please go to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Keto Woman or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman podcast website. It's thanks to the two Keto Dudes that I'm hosting this podcast, so please consider heading to their Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com and help them bring you more podcasts like this one. This week's quote is from Olivia Newton-John, or Olivia Neutron Bomb as we used to call her when I was growing up. I don't know what my path is yet, I'm just walking it. Bye bye Keto lovelies. (laughs) 